Luther, I think, gave us the formula for how to handle these things. It's you stand on Scripture alone and let the chips fall where they may. We're on the we're on the same side. We may disagree on, on certain theological issues, yeah, but, I, but I, we're I, on I, the I, same I, side. Not agree with Calvinism. No, not at all. And, and look I'm, how nice we are to each other. Yeah. No, I enjoy this and uh, appreciate all you do out there for the Lord. Yeah. It's like you know what. What are you doing? You're spending all your time trying to destroy another Christian because you don't understand what's going on when you should be out there winning people for Jesus. Uh, we're not supposed to be blind sheep. We're supposed to be Bereans. And so just to, no matter who it is, this goes for everybody. Um, you're, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. I, I love watching you and I love hearing what you have to say. And I think you're a, a great blessing to the body of Christ. Okay, welcome everybody to this week's episode of Conversations with Jeff. I'm really excited to have a very special guest. We've got uh, Trevor Loudon, who's the producer of the upcoming documentary, Enemies Within the Church. Welcome, Trevor, and glad that we could uh, sit down and have a conversation. Well, it's a pleasure, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, you know, I, th- I think one of the things that I... That I everybody really loves about me doing this podcast and that sort of thing is really getting to know a lot of these guests where I'll have people on and we'll kind of talk about issues and that sort of thing. But a lot of times they don't know their story or their background or something like that. So I'd love for you to kind of share your story, where you're coming from. That way people can kind of get to know you a bit as well. Well, uh, by my accent, I'm not from America. I'm originally from New Zealand, grew up in Christchurch, New Zealand. I've been coming here about 10 years, I suppose. I've lectured all over the country, probably about 500 groups and most of the lower 48. And my specialty is Marxism, radical, the radical left, and how it basically influences and even controls the mainstream political, you know, the mainstream political party like the Democrats, etc. So I was one of the first to, well, I was the first to publicly identify Barack Obama and his ties to the Hawaiian communist Frank Marshall Davis. I wrote a whole book, um, Barack Obama and the Enemies Within. I wrote another book called Enemies Within, Communist, Socialists and Progressives in the U.S. Congress, which detailed about, I think, 54 congressmen and 14 senators who couldn't pass a background check, including both of yours, Dianne Feinstein and Kamala Harris. And we did a film in 2016 called Enemies Within, which is seen over a million times on Amazon Prime. And it details the Marxist and Islamist infiltration at the highest levels of the Democratic Party. But Andrew Breitbart used to say, he would say, um, politics is downstream from culture. In other words, the culture shapes the politics. But he could have added that culture is downstream from religion. The religion shapes the culture and the culture shapes the politics. Our next movie is Enemies Within the Church, dealing the heavy Marxist infiltration of American Christianity. Even the evangelical and Baptist churches are now experiencing experiencing it. So um, I'm basically doing it, um, you know, if you want to save... New Zealand, you've got to save America. If America goes down, so is, so does everywhere else. If American Christianity is subverted and rotten, rotted, we lose America, we lose the Western world. So there's a whole bunch at stake here, Jeff. There's a whole, a whole lot of things. But that, that's a, a thumbnail sketch of where I come from. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and, and, I th- and I think one of the things that I find interesting about kind of your story and just a little bit that I, you know, that where I was kind of like looking in like what led up to this documentary and that sort of thing is from what I understand, like you're not a Christian yourself, but you're seeing the infiltration of this cultural Marxism and social justice coming into the church and you see that as a danger. What is it specifically about the church 
that is really concerning you with this infiltration of kind of this progressive ideology? Yeah. Well, I've been working with um, conservative Christians for years, both in New Zealand and here, and we share pretty much 99% of our values. So, um, but I was brought into this project because of my expertise on the left. My director, Judd Saul, um, he's a very, uh, very, he's a Christian guy out of Iowa, and he did the first movie with me, Enemies Within. And he started noticing in his own, um, you know, very evangelical church in Iowa, all this left wing stuff coming in, you know, critical race theory and, um, you know, social justice and, you know, support for illegal immigration and, um, you know, tax on, you know, we're all got to be concerned about global warming and things like this. So he got me to do some research into how, where these movements are coming from. And I also work with Kerry Gordon, who's going to be narrating the movie. He's a pastor from Sioux City, Iowa. And, and various uh, Thomas Littleton and others around the country have done a huge amount of research into the Marxist infiltration of the churches. And what I found was I already knew that the, Mar the Communist Party had infiltrated the, Eva, uh, the uh, Episcopalian Church and others right back in the 1920s. I knew the background of uh, the Marxist Pope Francis. But what I didn't know was the extensive infiltration of Marxism, even into the Southern Baptists, into the evangelical churches who have been pure up till now. And, you know, whether you're an atheist or whatever you are or a Christian, if we lose American Christianity, we lose American conservatism, we lose American politics, we lose the, the leader of the free world. If the, if, if the American Christianity goes to the left, which it's going at a very rapid pace right now, we will lose this country. And that's bad news for all of us. So what we want, part of the purpose of the movie is to see a spiritual revival in America, but it also will feed into a political revival as well. Um, because we're at a time under President Trump, like him or not, where the, where populism, where the people are fighting the elites and socialism is all about the elites. Socialism, despite what they say, is really about concentrating all wealth and all power in a very few hands. And you're getting millions of American Christians now going to church every Sunday and getting spoon fed pure Marxism, thinking it's Christianity. And that's in the uh, Bible colleges. It's in the seminaries. And the next generation of pastors are not going to be voting for Ronald Reagan or supporting Israel. They're going to be voting for Bernie Sanders and supporting Palestine. That, that's where it's heading. And that's hugely concerning for anyone who cares about liberty. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. And you know what, what's interesting to me is, you know, I've been hearing a lot of people, and I would agree, but I've been hearing a lot of people saying that the church is kind of that final stand within like American politics and that sort of thing. What is it about the church, especially specifically the Christian church, compared to other religions or other, you know, identity groups or whatever it is? What is it about Christianity that does make us the final stand that if the Christian church goes, there goes essentially America and freedom and liberty and that sort of thing? Well, exactly. Well, well America was not founded as a Buddhist country or a Muslim country. It came out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, if you look at representative government, you know that came out of that came from Moses. You know when he was leading the people to the out of the out of out of Egypt, he was getting besieged by requests all the time, and he said, "Look, this is driving me crazy. Go away and delegate. Don't send me a thousand people every day. Send me ten people every day." You know this, and this was the for this was the birth of representative government. When the American Republic was founded. It was really refounded over, over religious liberty because you had 13 colonies, most of them based on some Christian denomination. You know, Maryland was Catholic, you know, Pennsylvania was Quaker, etc. And so they had mainly fled Europe over religious persecution issues. And when they saw, saw King George reaching out to the colonies and throwing his weight around, they knew what was coming. 
They didn't fight that religion over taxes on tea, uh, that war over taxes on tea. It was fought over religious liberty. And when the Republic was founded, it was founded on a brand new principle. You know, every country in the world, every nation in the world had been a, a dictatorship of some kind, uh, you know, and, and the dictators would always claim a mandate from God. God told me this is what you must do. So you, if you disobey me, you are disobeying God. Well, the American Revolution was founded on the principle that your rights did not come from the king, come from God via the king. They came directly from God. Your rights to religious liberty, your rights to keep and bear arms, your rights to free speech. That was all God given. There was no intermediary. And you had a represent. So your rights came from God. And therefore, the government could not take them away because the government didn't give them. And you had representative government and a constitution to defend those rights. So that is what made America great. The Christian underpinnings of America set the people free. They gave them certainty, the rule of law, a constitution. And whether you were Christian or not, you were in a system that, that allowed you to prosper, that allowed you to set up great universities and, and great businesses and churches and, 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 you know, to spread the gospel all over the world. And America has done more to do that than any other country. So basically, Christianity is the underpinning of the free constitutional system that has made America the greatest country the world has ever known. So if we lose the underpinning, if we lose the Christian base that gave us this great country, how are we expected to maintain a free and constitutional republic? America will slide into the tyranny, the world will slide into the tyranny that has beset mankind forever. There's been one little break you know, one little break in world history where a government was founded directly on Christian principles, the people were set free, they achieved great things, they liberated the world, and we're on the verge of losing that. Everybody should be concerned about that. You know, whether you're Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, whatever, atheist, if you love liberty, you have to understand the value of American Christianity, not just from the political basis, but from the spiritual basis that it's given America, the, the decent society that's grown out of that. You know, um, all the great things that we owe, that we have in America, basically come out of Christianity. Yeah, and, you know, and, and I think one of the things in dealing with how the church, it seems, has flipped so quickly is it's crazy to me how Christianity for the most part has been known as being extremely conservative and always voting Republican or at the very least libertarian or third party, it was almost never Democrat. Now all of a sudden that's changed in the matter of a couple of years. How, how, how has, you know, whoever is behind all of this, how have they flipped Christianity into being not strictly a conservative voting bloc but now, at the very least, it seems like we're split 50-50, if not heading in the completely opposite direction. Yeah, we are. Look, look it depends what part of the... <clears throat> it depends what part of the country you're in and what denomination you're affiliated with. And the home churches generally remain very conservative. Well, you know, look, conservative politics flow out of a good biblical understanding. If you really understand the Bible, it's all about, you know, self-responsibility, it's all about um, your direct relationship with God. It's not about the state. You know, it's not about government. It's not about socialism. And so, um, but, you know, there are things in Christianity like, you know, um, you know, they use things like, you know, you, you know, you're commanded to love God and thy neighbor as thyself. You know, charity is a big thing in Christianity. So they will say, well, charity is just, socialism really isn't it you know it's just why not why why do you have to give all the charitable money just get the government to do it that's fulfilling your christian duty um one argument's been that's been used to uh flip christians who don't vote democrat because of the abortion issue they will say well look 
don't get hung up on that. Um, because if we vote for these Democrat social programs, that will cut poverty and there'll be ne less need for abortion. So therefore, by voting Democrat, the party that just loves abortion will actually be able to cut the number of abortions. The, but but oh, so these are the arguments that are used, that are the arguments, you know, um, Jesus welcomed immigrants, you know, um, Jesus was an immigrant, so therefore we should allow illegal immigrants to cross the southern border, and we're Christian if we refuse. Well, I think it's Acts 26, you know, it said um, God set the boundaries of nations. Um, the Old Testament was all about building walls, you know, Nehemiah's wall, etc. How many times did the Israelites have to build a wall to protect their national security? Um you know, white privilege uh, is another thing that's crept into the churches. That is a pure Marxist concept. It comes out of the Maoist movement. But what has happened, really, for a long time, you had a, a deliberate Communist Party, Soviet infiltration of the mainstream uh, Episcopalian, Methodist, Presbyterian churches. The Catholic churches had a long running battle with Marxism in their church. It's gone on for 60 years now and now they have a Marxist Pope. But these pesky evangelicals and Baptists, you know, they don't go, they don't fall for this garbage. They keep on doing things like electing Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. This is aggravating to the left. This is destroying the left's plans. So for the last 15 years, people like Jim Wallace, Obama's, you know, faith advisor, a complete Marxist, have been slowly bringing their doctrines into the evangelical churches. This has also been accentuated by a group called the Gospel Coalition, headed by a man called Tim Keller. Um, he has got several Marxists involved in that group. Mark Deaver and other leftists are involved in that. Tim Keller says that when he was a young man, he was a, a, a devotee of the Frankfurt School. Well, the Frankfurt School was a, a, a Marxist school that had to flee Nazi Germany, set up, set up at Columbia University, and basically gave us the free, the, the free love generation of the 60s and political correctness and a whole lot of other damaging stuff. So Tim Keller, who's regarded as a very, um, quite a conservative Christian by many, has written many popular books, is leading a group called the Gospel Coalition which is spreading critical race theory, social justice, and other Marxist concepts right through the evangelical churches. These guys are writing books, holding seminars, doing conferences. Look, I'll give you one little example. Uh, there was, uh, we've got it on tape, it'll be in our movie. There was a, a woman called Michelle Higgins out in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And she convened, she spoke at a, a, a convention in the Midwest a couple of years ago for young evangelical Christians from the Midwest. And as it was the Midwest, most of these kids are white. So she gets up, she's black, she gets up and she says, the thing that God wants you to do more than anything else is to end white privilege. And she gets these kids fired up thinking this is the 11th commandment or something. You know, they're all fired up to end white privilege. What they don't know is Michelle Higgins is a member of the Organization for Black Struggle, which is a front for the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, a pro-Chinese communist group that gave you Black Lives Matter and the concept of white privilege. She is forcing Marxism down these kids' throats and they're thinking it's Christianity. And they're all going out you know, pushing for reparations, pushing for affirmative action, voting Democrat, you know. One more little thing on that. Um, the uh, Southern Baptists recently adopted, at their convention in Alabama, adopted critical race theory as part of their sort of church toolbox, so to speak. It was a resolution passed at their convention by about a 60-30 vote. And it was pushed by uh, Walter Strickland out of Southeastern Baptist and a few others. Uh, Russell Moore, the head of the Ethics Commission in the Southern Baptist, by the way, is a leading member of the Gospel Coalition and 
a hardcore leftist. So they pushed this through and they all adopted it. It's critical race theory. But what is that? That came from James Cone, a Marxist, who wrote things like, what does Marxism have to teach the black church? He went to Cuba in 1982 with Reverend Jeremiah Wright, you know, you know, God damn KKK America, you know, Obama's Marxist pastor. It is all about the whole concept of critical race theory is whites are automatically racist because whites are part of the power structure. Blacks cannot be racist because they don't have power because you can only be a racist if you have power. So therefore, to end racism, you have to end white capitalism. So they adopted a predominantly a Probably, probably predominantly white denomination, but they adopted the Marxist theory that they're all racists and the only way to end racism is to overthrow white capitalism. This is part of the Southern Baptist toolbox now. So this has been an infiltration project that has gone into the evangelical and Baptist churches through the Gospel Coalition, the Kern Foundation and other groups that has basically flipped some of these churches in very recent times. Um, they purged Paige Patterson, the conservative leader of the Southern Baptists, and J.D. Greer is going all along, all on board with this. And so the largest Protestant denomination in the country is now going Marxist. And I guarantee most people in the pews have no idea of the ramifications of this, none whatsoever. Yeah, well, you know, and, and that's that's the thing, too, I feel like when we're, when we're dealing with this and why I think so many people have been led astray, especially within Christianity. So when we're dealing with, like, mainstream, I feel like in the political scene, everybody is, like, full-on, head-on promoting a lot of these ideologies, right? You know, whether it's Bernie Sanders or AOC or whoever it is. But then within the church, it seems like everything is a lot more subversive which I think makes things more confusing and makes the people in the pews and a lot of these pastors accept this stuff. So like, for example, when you've got Tim Keller and his organization, the Gospel Coalition, the premise of the Gospel Coalition is we're uniting around the gospel. But really, all they're really doing is promoting Marxist, social justice, uh, you know, cultural Marxism, just galore everywhere. They're almost not even talking about the gospel anymore. But the, well, but the yeah. premise is the gospel. Well, that, that's right. And, and see, when the communists, and actually this is Communist Party members who went into the event, went into the mainstream churches, you know, the, the Episcopalians and the, you know, the Methodists, they, they tried to push it Marx, full on Marxist. And they, they hooked them all up with the World Council of Churches, which was run by the Russian Orthodox Church, essentially, which was run by the KGB. So they were teaching straight out Marxism, and that drove lots of people out of the churches, and many of them went into the evangelical movement. And so they realized they can't, you know, the evangelicals are hardcore, you know, they, these people believe in the Bible, and they really try, they're not like these sort of Sunday Christians who go along to the, you know, the old mainline churches. These people actually try and live their faith. So we can't just come along and say, we're all Marxists now. So they teach 90% gospel. It's all a gospel-centered message, the gospel coalition. It's all 90% absolutely fine. Tim Keller will preach a great, great sermon. Um, Rick Warren out in you know California, not far from you, will preach a great sermon. But then he'll do one on on uh, on uh, illegal immigration. Then you'll then if you find out he's Obama's favorite pastor. Then you find out he was in the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, a Marxist group. So they will preach 90% Marxism, 95% uh, 90, gospel, but they add a little bit of communism in there. You know, a little bit of social justice. Well, that's in the Bible, right? You know, the Bible is all about charity and looking after your neighbor. Let's get the government to do it for us. Let's sign up with a faith-based partnership with the government and get lots of money from them. Um, you know, critical race theory where, look, you know, you know, the Southern Baptists, you had all these white guys up there at their convention crying on stage because of their racism. You know, they're just 
they irredeemably racist. You know, they it's a little five percent poison will destroy a whole batch, won't it? And that's what they're doing. They're putting this five percent poison in there. I'll give you one little example of it destroying a church this way. Uh, I got this from a friend who was at South Southeastern Baptist, and he tells a story about a, a little church in Car North Carolina. And the new pastor came there, and he's all fired up with critical race theory, which they teach at South Eastern like it's gospel, you know. And um, he noticed there was two two families in the in the in the uh, congregation. One was black, one was white, but they both had the same surname. So he deduced from that that the white family must have once owned the black family you know, 100 years ago, 200, 200 years ago. Therefore, the white family owed an apology for the sin of slavery to the black family. Now, the white family says, no, we don't, because we were never involved in this. You're absolutely fallacious. And, we, and even if we did, that's our ancestors. That's not us. Christianity doesn't tell you you're guilty you're guilty for what you do, not what for someone else does. But the pastor wouldn't budge and it split and it caused a big division in the church. And that church now no longer exists because some idiot Marxist who thought he was preaching Christianity basically split his own church. And this is going on all over America now, which is why you're seeing you're going to see the growth of the home churches to get away from this. And but the big churches still have a lot of a lot of people and a lot of money and a lot of political um, clout, and it only takes a few of them, and we're going to see, you know, a, a whole change in the politics and culture of this country if this is not reversed and reversed very soon. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I totally agree, and I think I think w one of my favorite quotes from uh, Charles Spurgeon is. Uh, discernment is not being able to tell the difference between right and wrong. It's being able to tell the difference between right and almost right. And I feel like that's why yes, that's yes. why this is so dangerous. Is that because, like you were saying, they're they're preaching ninety five percent gospel, ninety five percent of the good stuff, but it's just subtly, slightly different enough to where it's leading people astray and leading people into this progressive ideology, which is anti Christian, anti gospel, all that that sort of thing. That yeah. to me is why this is so dangerous. Is that it's so close, but it's off yeah. enough to be a completely di separate thing. Well, that's right. Aren't you commanded to be as wise as serpents, mm -hmm. you know, and gentle as doves? You know, Christianity isn't just believing everything you're told. You've got to separate what is truth and what is almost truth. It's Spurgeon. That's a great quote from Spurgeon. And you're not going to go into a Christian church and say we're all going to be Marxists now. We're changing the whole. Bible, it's all about Marxism. Everybody will walk out. You can't do that. But you can get into the seminaries and you put a little bit of critical race theory in there and a little bit of um, social justice in there and a little bit of something else and you weave that in with the gospel and you get these young pastors who are not well educated, who may not may have even had a secular background. You know, have gone to a maybe gone to a seeker-friendly church that didn't really teach them a heck of a lot, and they're just ripe for this stuff. You know, and so we're losing. Um, you're losing seminaries and, and Bible colleges all over the country. They're all falling for this. So these young guys are going to be out doing the pastoring in the next decade, and um, they're going to be meeting a whole lot of people in the churches who have already been led astray a little bit. And they will complete the job. And, and American Christianity will be completely unrecognizable in a decade, the way we're going. Yeah. Now, yeah. I kind of want to dive a little bit into some of, like, the specific issues that are around this. Because, I, because and it, one thing that I think we need to be careful of, and I think why the cultural Marxists have really been uh, able to push this along, is because... A lot of times they're able to win the individual arguments and convince people of the individual arguments. But a lot of times, too, we need to understand there's a bigger, broader picture of, sure, maybe they can convince you about their view on illegal immigration. But then combine that with the race issues, combine that with the income inequality and all that kind of stuff. We kind of have to be careful that we're not getting so divided 
and um, and so distracted by all these different issues and understand this is one big ideology with all these different facets. But I did kind of want to break down some of these issues of like if we're dealing with the race issue, right? Critical race theory, there's like a hierarchy depending on you know what color your skin is or your cultural background or whatever it is. How do you refute that kind of an argument where you can actually convince somebody that believes in this stuff, hey, you know, this is actually wrong? Well, where, where is color mentioned in the Bible? Where, where is it said in the Bible that certain races um, you know, they talk of, you know, certain races are more spiritually advanced than others or, you know, that Chinese are, you know, more oppressed than others. Where, where is oppression even come into the Bible? There is none of it. It's, it's, it's all about the individual's relationship with God. That's what it's about. So why are you putting an extra layer of stuff that somehow because you've got a black skin or you've got a yellow skin or a brown skin or you've been oppressed, you know, because a, you're a woman, you know, the, the, the maximum pressure, you, you got to be a woman of color and preferably gay. Then you've got, you, then you're all, you know, then you must be a perfect person because you're so oppressed. It's all completely unbiblical. There's nothing remotely mentioned about this in the Bible. The Bible is all about man's individual relationship with God and your own personal responsibility. Um, so Marxism believes that we're not individuals. We are groups who compete. Um, that, 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 that if one group is doing better, it's because they've oppressed another group. So therefore, the idea of white privilege, that whites um, are racist, because they are only rich because they've oppressed the black races and the brown races and the yellow races and they've expropriated their property and all this kind of thing. That is Marxism. That's the idea that we're not individuals. We are competing groups that have different interests. The Bible basically says you're an individual. You're seeking God. You're seeking salvation. And you, you have a duty to your brothers to help them as well. There is no racial division there. There is no um, idea of oppression because of your race. It's, it's irrelevant to the Bible. So if you bring that in as some sort of biblical standard, you are, that is an, an act of corruption. That's nothing to do with it. Yeah. 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 Now, now what, what, what do you think? What is their goal? with this kind of ideology and in this kind of like division based off of like the color of your skin or your background or your identity or whatever it is. What's their ultimate goal? Because we see the application of it, but what's their what's their actual motivation when you get down into their thinking, their ideology and that sort of thing? Well, you know, ever since the foundation of Christianity, um, there are people who have been trying to destroy it. You know, secular powers have tried to destroy it because you know, they want allegiance to them, not to God. So they've always been trying to destroy Christianity or, or more likely to co-opt Christianity. You know, they, they you know, you have a set up a state church and the king rules the church and you, you rule people that way. But then you have the science of Marxism, which came along in the 1850s. Uh, and that really, see, see, ultimately, you got a battle between God and Satan. You know, ultimately, you've got a battle between good and evil. So evil has always sought to divide. Evil has always sought to cause confusion, to to create chaos, to break down relationships, and especially the relationship between man and God. That's the ultimate goal of of, of the devil, to, to, to win people to him, not to God. So therefore, you need to break down Christianity, you need to subvert Christianity, you need to um, twist Christianity. You know, the devil is the father of lies, and he's very subtle. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, hey, I think I want to go to hell. I'm really, really fired up about going to hell, no pun intended. You know, people go to hell by making by accepting a little lie here and a little lie here and a little bit of more of a lie and a bit more of a lie and a bit more of a lie until they have gone completely off track. So 
ultimately there's there's two there's two forces here one is is marxism wants which wants world revolution it wants an overthrow of the existing order and a world socialist state now if you're an atheist you can accept that you can accept that well that's what marxists do that's what ocasio cortez wants that's what bernie sanders wants that's what fidel castro and kim il jong want they want an overturning of the order because you look at what what is revolution Revolution is the overturning of the natural hierarchies. And the natural hierarchy is God, man, nature. You know, father, mother, family, boss, worker, you know, unions overturn that hierarchy. You know, the, the destruction of the family is overturning the natural family there, the feminist, radical feminists. Um, you know, the, the environmentalists want to make nature God, you know, and, and man underneath nature. So so that is part of it. There's a revolutionary movement that wants to destroy Christianity because they want to break that link with God. And then if you look back further, you know, what is communism? It's, it's obviously to me a satanic movement. You know, it, it's the, the scientific application of the principles of evil on the human race. It's a systematized, um, you know, we've always had evil and princes have been sort of evil, but they've been amateurs. You know, Marx made it more scientific. Lenin made it more scientific. Gramsci made it more scientific still. You know, they worked on human nature. They worked on psychology. You know, they incorporated Freud into it and all these other things. So. Their motivation is destructive. Their motivation is to dethrone God, become emperors and, and rulers of the earth. Um, so on a secular plane, it's it's a Marxist revolution. On a spiritual plane, it's the dethroning of God. And you think, you know, go back to Milton, Paradise Lost. Why did Satan leave heaven? Because he'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. They don't care what this turns into. They don't. They know it's going to be a hellhole, but that's all right. They'll be in charge. They'll have power, ego, power, and that's been the motivation of every dictator and every evil person that the world has ever seen. And um, they're seducing people with these little lies, just a few lies here and a few more lies here, and um, you're in your church and. You're not hearing anything about sin anymore, but you are hearing a lot about refugees, and you're not hearing much about redemption anymore, but you are hearing a lot about global warming and social justice. And you go into church and think you're being a faithful Christian, and you're being seduced away, basically, into Marxism. And uh, that's how I think it works. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, and I think too, kind of going along with that is that. I think, you know, looking at it from the Christian perspective, we do know that the ultimate goal down the road in the book of Revelation is talking about establishing the one world government and essentially getting rid of all the borders and all that kind of stuff, which we're seeing, again, the big push coming yeah, with the yeah. Democrats and that sort of thing. Like when we're dealing with, you know, the issue of like illegal immigration and border security and that sort of thing, is that is that ultimately just the goal is just let's get rid of borders altogether so that way we can have one centralized, essentially, UN over the entire world. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the goal of world government is no borders. The goal of communism is no borders. And just, just do a little bit of math here to see how close we are to this. And see, if, you, if you're a, a conservative Christian who votes conservatively, see, Hillary Clinton promised that she was going to legalize every single illegal immigrant in America within 100 days of taking office, right? Now, think what that would have meant. Mitt Romney, you know, I know he's a Mormon, but, you know, he was a Republican. He, uh, he, he lost his election by two and a half million votes out of 100 million cast. Um, Donald Trump won by about 200,000 votes nationwide, thanks to the wisdom of the founding fathers and the Electoral College, and actually lost the popular vote by about 3 million. Now, according to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there are 22 million illegal immigrants in the country right now. Some people say it's more like 45 million, but, you know, we'll just go with 22. 
So what do you think? A lot of these people are Christian people. But if they're given citizenship and voting rights by the next Democrat president, what proportion of them do you think will vote Democrat? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking virtually all of them. If they're, if they're, if they're getting yeah. their, essentially their American freedom through them, of yeah. course they're going to vote Democrat. Exactly. So that's going to give the Democrats 22 million of them, say 15, 16 million new voters overnight. That's it. Texas goes blue. North Carolina goes blue. Georgia goes blue. Florida goes blue. Arizona goes blue. You will never elect another conservative president ever. The Republican Party will be finished. The Democrats will rule forever. The Democrats are now controlled by Marxists and they will come after their enemies. And who are their worst enemies in this country? It is Christians. You know, they've already passed the Equality Act, which basically would destroy Christianity as we know it in this country. That passed through the Democrat House. Of course, it failed in the Republican Senate. But if the Democrats win the next election and they have the presidency and the Senate, it goes through. And every straight up Bible believing American church in this country will automatically come under huge pressure. You know, you'll have a little church in, say, Iowa, and a couple of gay people will come along and say, hey, hey uh, we'd really love to get married in your cute little church. And the pastor will say, well, you know, maybe you should go somewhere else because that's really against our beliefs. We don't believe in gay marriage. And then the next week you get a letter from the Justice Department threatening a $5 million lawsuit for discrimination under the Equality Act, which will make it illegal to discriminate on those lines. And the pastor has a choice, buckle under or lose his church. And what do you think most of them are going to do? Yeah, well, yeah. You know, honest, honestly, I, th I think we're going to see so many co so many churches compromise left and right yeah. if that kind of thing happens. Well, look, they already are. Many of them already are, but that's just going to be the icing on the cake. That's going to finish it off. But see, illegal immigration has always been promoted by the Marxists. It started out with a California Communist Party member uh, back in the 50s. He started this whole movement. Uh, the leader of the movement in recent times is Alisao Medina, a member of Democratic Socialists of America, a Marxist, and Obama's immigration advisor. The idea is you got a conservative Christian base in this country, and it's stopping socialism. It's the only thing that's stopping socialism. So how do we destroy them? Well, we come after them legally, but we swamp them politically. You know, we bring in 20, 30 million people from over the border who will vote Democrat. We will bring in hundreds of thousands of Muslim refugees from the Middle East. And we don't put them in Los Angeles and Boston. We put them in Iowa and Minnesota and rural Texas, all the conservative districts. You know, I was in St. Cloud, I was in a little town called Wilmar, Minnesota, you know, and that was Michelle Bachman's district, one of the most conservative parts of Minnesota. Well, Wilma now has 15,000 people and 5,000 of them are Somali Muslims. You know, and what do you think the Democrats are going to do? They're going to take their buses in there and take them around to multiple polling places and not long that will be a Democrat district. And they're doing that all over the Midwest right now. They're destroying this country deliberately through demographics illegal immigration, refugee resettlement, and you got millions of Christians doing the communist work for them, thinking they're doing God's work. It's like somebody going around Nehemiah's wall, and as they build it, taking the bricks down. You know, that's mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're taking the bricks down that we have to, to keep this country surviving, and these millions of Christians think they're doing God's work by destroying America. That's how that's how perverted this is all got. Yeah, which which is crazy to me. Thinking that I get the strategy of the Democrats, especially dealing with this issue, because they're trying to win elections, right? So if they if they can legalize all these illegal immigrants, that's basically guaranteed. Democrats have the presidency, the House, and the Senate for gen yeah. generations, right? What what I don't understand is the strategy from some of these pastors, these guys that we used to consider the conservative evangelical leaders. 
Like, why are all of a sudden they changing? Why are all of a sudden they embracing and saying, we need to bring in all of these refugees from the Middle East. We need to be welcoming to the illegal immigrants because of their backgrounds or their experiences or whatever it is. Why are they changing all of a sudden, do you think? Well, there's two reasons. One is there's a whole bunch of money in this and a whole bunch of churches have signed up to the refugee resettlement program and they get two and a half thousand dollars a head just to bring them in, put them in a town, give them some food and send them on their way. So there's money and that the, the Lutheran church has gone big for this. Not so much evangelical churches, but they've gone big for this. But what they tell, what they tell evangelicals is this, the country is browning. America is browning. To make sure the church survives, we have to become part of this movement. We have to reach out to our Hispanic brothers, um, you know, from across the border, and and we have to become brown churches. That's why this big thing about diversity in the churches now, you know, you, they're doing audits in the church. You know, you get a church in the middle of Iowa where there's where they're all white, and they they're complaining because it's not diverse enough. Why haven't you got Hispanics? Why haven't you got blacks and Asians in your congregation? This is a badge of honor, apparently now. You got to recruit people and bring them, bust them in, or something to get your quota, and um, so that they have been drawn in partially by the money and partially by the argument that this is inevitable, and if we stand against this inevitable browning of America, this is a false dichotomy, false argument. If we stand against this, the churches will be marginalised and become irrelevant. So therefore, to make sure the church prospers and survives, we've got to support illegal immigration amnesty. We've got to support open borders. We've got to get on side with the, our brown brothers from over the border. This is all a total lie, but this is what the left are feeding into the movement. You know, something like 60% of Hispanics in this country, legal Hispanics, oppose illegal immigration. They hate it. They don't like being tarred with the illegal brush when they've been here for six generations. You know, so this is a completely bogus argument, but that's what they are spreading in the churches now. And this is what the Gospel Coalition is spreading. The churches, America's browning, and we have to brown with it. Yeah. So we yeah. have to welcome the, the browning and, and enable the browning. Well, no, you don't. You just, this is not a racial thing. You just preach the gospel. And if brown people come to your church, that's great. If white people come, doesn't matter. Who cares? You know? But this whole Marxist race based argument is just destroying us. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I, I'm looking at the comments really quick on on Facebook, and Elizabeth just said she said she brought up the point that liberal professors and seminaries are, are this is a long time coming. They're sneaking liberal ideas into the church. Where We know that the communists and the socialists have infiltrated the education system, especially with the universities and that sort of thing. Where specifically within Christianity are the, the, coll the Christian colleges, the Bible colleges, and the seminaries? How much blame do they have in this infiltration? A lot. Now, look, look um, you've got straight up Marxists teaching in some of these seminaries. You've got Democratic Socialists of America, for instance, has a religious commission. And they recruit pastors and put the and, and young seminarians and and actually spread Marxism in these seminaries. Uh, the Communist Party USA is a similar thing. But what you've got is, you know, like Walter Strickland, uh, you know, Southeastern Bible, Southeastern Baptist. He was the one who gave put critical race theory on the table at the Southern Baptist College. You know, he's in the church. And he talks about how biblical he is, but he promotes pure Marxism. So, A, was he a Marxist who adopted Christianity, or is he a Christian who's just been swayed by Marxist ideals? I think a lot of the, I think it's a mixture of both. You got some Marxists who are actually go, like to be to uh, the guy, what the a black guy on the uh, on the Gospel Coalition. I think it's a Tabidi, yeah. Yeah, Tabidi. He was a Marxist. He openly praised communism as a young man. He was openly a Marxist. Now he's a Christian, but he's still preaching Marxism. So what is he? He's a Christian who's been 
remembered as Marxist ideals, or has he always been a Marxist and has used the church, you know, for a vehicle? I just want to give one example. Um, uh, back from in the old days, there was a, a, a very prominent American Christian regarded as the most prominent ang uh, Protestant theologian of the 20th century, a man called Joseph Fletcher. Now, he wrote a book called Situation Ethics back in 1966, and that took America by storm and the churches by storm. He said, basically, forget the Old Testament. Your morality should be determined by the circumstances. So if you steal to feed your family, as long as it's an act of love, that's okay. You know, and it's situation ethics is basically most people's ethical system now. They don't reference the Old Testament. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. It's what can I do? What do I need to do to make this situation right regarding, you know, the circumstances? Now, after he wrote this book, he actually left the church. He'd been a professor of, at the Episcopalian Bible College, Harvard, etc. He left the church, proclaimed himself an atheist, and set up a, a euthanasia group and other things. But if you trace his history back, he was involved in several communist fronts in the 1930s. While he was in Massachusetts, he was a secret supporter of the Communist Party. He was also working in the World Peace Council and several other Soviet fronts. So was he a Christian with socialist ideas, or was he a communist who went into the church to twist the church to socialism? I think the evidence points to the latter. And I think there's a lot of these people in the church. They are Marxist first, Christian second. And they influence a whole lot of people who are genuine Christians by filling their heads full of unbiblical Marxist stuff. So, but the, the, the Bible colleges, the seminaries, Southeastern, Southeast, Southeastern Baptists and others, this is where it's really coming in. So they put professors into these groups. They get one professor in there who appoints more. And then they get rid of the leader of yeah, they get rid of the conservatives. They purge the conservatives. You you talk to people who go to southeast southeastern Baptist. It's like a little um, like a little uh, concentration camp there. You do not oppose the prevailing doctrines. You are taught social justice, and you will believe in social justice and and critical race theory, and you do not challenge it. And and just like they took over the universities and the teachers training colleges and the journalism schools that are now taken over the seminaries and Bible colleges. Not all of them, but a big chunk of the influential ones. Yeah, well, that, yeah. that's the crazy thing to me, is that I feel like tolerance used to be the thing that everybody was preaching, you know, let's say 10 years ago. Like, that was the thing that everybody was preaching, and now all of a sudden, there's no tolerance for anybody. No. And we're so divided, everybody's fighting, and yeah. you can't even share your opinion in class or else you're gonna get an F. Like, it, it's yeah. crazy how things are. Like, so, yeah. Yeah, no, well, go ahead. Toler tor tolerance is used to bring bad ideas into good systems. And once the bad ideas are dominant, forget tolerance. There's no more tolerance. Um, you know, like the first, the communists always used to used to use the First Amendment. You know, we got a First Amendment right to preach communism. We got a First Amendment right to spread pornography. We got a First Amendment right. And when they've got all these ideas into the system, and somebody comes along to challenge them, nah, forget it. You know, you, the tolerance ends when the left wins. That's always been the way they use tolerance to get where they need to go. But once they've got there. They are not going to brook any opposition whatsoever. Yeah, well, like that's even the, the thing that I'm that I'm seeing. Even when we're dealing with how Christians engage just with each other in regards to politics and how we're going to vote and president and all that and that whole thing is, I get in the secular world. Obviously, you you can't say anything about you know if you're going to vote for anybody on the conservative side, whether it's President Trump, whether it's anybody down the list. But I feel like now we're even getting into that point where in the church itself and within Christianity itself, it's like you can't even be a conservative anymore or else you're going to be deplatformed. You're not going to be invited mm -hmm. to the conferences. You're not going to be on the circuit. Like, 
I feel like everything that we're seeing in the secular world is now being dropped into the Christian world almost that, identically. That, that's exactly right. Well, you know, like 30 years ago, they had Marxists in the universities. You had a few. 20 years ago, you had a lot of Marxists in the universities, but you still had a little bit of a, you know, you could still speak your mind. 10 years ago, they had heaps of Marxists in the universities, and it was getting pretty hard to be a conservative, you know. Now they run the universities, and they'll kick you out and mark you down and shut you up if you dare to say anything conservative. Well, that's what's happening in the churches now. It isn't quite as advanced as the universities because they, you know, the Christianity was a hard nut to crack. You know, how do you, you know, Christianity stood, stands against Marxism, against all the ideas that Marxism stands for. You don't just waltz into the churches and change them overnight. But they've been doing it for the last 10 or 15 years and they've got getting towards a critical mass now. And you see it. You, you, I'm sure you see it. And and it's getting close to critical mass. It's getting close to the point of no return in many churches. And so um, that's why I'm saying, well, once the churches are gone, well, where do we go then? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's a re- it's a really good question. I th- I, th- I honestly think we're getting to that point to where there's going to be a lot of home churches, a lot of smaller churches, and that sort of thing. And I think that's going to end up being the response within the church. Um, now I, it, it, it is, but, 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 you know, you're still seeding ground to the bad guys. There's still millions of bad guys out there talks, preach, preach, preaching Marxism in the name of Christianity, and they'll be the ones that have the influence on the politics. Yeah. So I applaud the growth of the home church movement. I abs- absolutely applaud it. But why are we giving up 90% of Christianity to Marxism? Yeah, yeah. What, which, which I think leads leads us back into, you know, you've you've got this documentary that's coming out that you guys have been that you guys have been working on and putting together and that sort of thing. Um, ex, you know, share kind of with with the audience, the people that are watching this. Like, what is it th- about this documentary that is like, okay, this this is the thing that we're going to be be using to confront this ideology? You know, because I know you guys have interviewed yeah. a lot of great experts, a lot of great information, and that sort of thing. So, kind of give people a little bit of rundown on your documentary. Yeah, well, we want to use it to start a movement. And, and look, what there is in the churches right now is a lot of confusion. You know, people go, they become Christians, they go to church, and they're getting all these left-wing messages, and it doesn't really gel with what they expected, but, you know, you, know, you, you go along with it. You know, these people know more than I do. And so what we want to do is draw some clear signposts. We want to say this is, we're not going to get too, sec- too sectarian about it, but this is what Christianity stands for. This is what Marxism stands for. This is how Marxism is influencing Christianity. These are the Marxist messages that Christians are teaching you, your so-called Christians. We're going to draw a line so people actually know what's right and what's wrong. We're not going to be, you know, not going to ram. We're going to. In, this, in simple form, we're going to show how this works. We're going to show some of the mechanism of the people doing it, and we're going to show the consequences of what, how this happens. But what we want to do is encourage people to either take back their existing church, you know, the idea, you know, if your pastor's getting a bit off track, you have a duty to go to him and try and set him right. If your church elders are getting a bit off track, you've got to make a stand on this. Now, some churches can be redeemed, some can be saved. If they're not, everybody's got to make a decision. First, can I save my church? You try it. If you can't, you've got to find another church where you're going to be taught, where you're going to hear the truth. So we want to make a, you know, they say, they, they always complain the left, oh, you're a divider, you're dividing the church. Well, absolutely. You've got to have the wheat and the chaff. Not all Christianity is equal now. Some of it's good, some of it's terrible, and a whole bunch of it's in the middle. And so we've got to draw more of the people in the middle to the good side and make the lines much more clearer so people can understand what is right and what is wrong and where they're being deceived. Like one thing we want to do in the, um, at the end, of, we're going to, we have a website and, and uh, we want to have a website where you can post, put in your zip code and you'll get a list in your zip code of all the churches 
who subscribe to our message, who believe what we're saying, you know, that, you know, that the, these churches will promise to preach the Bible and not preach Marxism. So you can look in that thing and find which churches in your zip code it's safe to go to. So we want to encourage people to go to the good churches and desert the bad churches. We want to start help to start a revival in this country. And we to do that, we need to draw the lines so people can see very clearly what is good and what is bad. Because of mil- millions of young people and, and old, so old, old people are going to churches every Sunday in this country thinking they're learning Christianity and they're learning something very, very different. But they don't know the difference. Yeah, which which I think which I think is like the really important thing is people need to actually understand what all this is. So that way, when they do hear it in their pul- in the pulpits, then they know okay, like this is this is wrong. Let's take it back to the Bible. Let's take it back to God's mm-hmm. word and compare it with Scripture. Clearly, socialism is wrong and anti you know Christian and that sort of thing. Um, so when you're when you're when we're talking about like your documentary and the movie you guys got have coming out, like who are some of the experts if you if you can share that you have in there that you guys are interviewing? Because I because I've heard you know some of the names that are involved with it, and it's it's a great list of people who actually know this stuff inside and out. Well, I think people can go to a trailer and have a look. You know, um, Kerry Gordon will be narrating it. We've got Thomas Littleton will be in there who does pulpit and pen, and he's done some of the best research on the subject. We've got Michael O'Fallon, who's very uh, well known in the in the sort of reformed world, who, who's making a stand on these issues. But we, we've we've got a lot of people. You you will see Matt Truella, I think, it will be part of this, and he's a uh, guy from up in Wisconsin who is very vocal on this we're also going to have um, we're going to have some Catholics in there we're going to we're going to treat this this is a full-on assault on Christianity per se not just one denomination or another we're not going to be sectarian in this Christianity is under attack on every front in the Orthodox churches the evangelical churches the mainstream churches the Catholic Church you decide what you believe where you want to go but we want to, the same methods are being used to attack every single denomination right now. Yeah, and and I, th- and I think that's important to understand too. And I and I and I keep saying this to people is that this this idea of cultural Marxism it's not a theological thing in the sense of the movement itself. It's a political ideology that's cut that they're now combining with Christian theology to try to get it inside the church. And I and I think that we're seeing a very similar strategy like what you were saying of. It's infiltrating mainstream evangelicalism, but it is also infiltrating the Catholic Church. Even though a lot of us that would be evangelical would believe that they don't believe in a, in the one true gospel. We obviously we disagree on a lot of theological issues and that sort of thing. But the same political strategy of infiltration is happening yeah. in both instances. Yeah. See, in the Catholic Church, they call it liberation theology, right? Mm-hmm. And um, see, see what happened with the Catholics is. They were making no headway in Latin America whatsoever because the Catholic Church, whatever you think of it, is staunchly anti-communist, staunchly. So the KGB set up a conference in Venezuela in 1957, invited every left winger they could find in the church. And that's where they set up a thing called liberation theology. And that was basically Marxism with a Catholic veneer. You know, heaven wasn't up there. Heaven is on earth when we get socialism, right? So, so, and Pope Francis is very much part of that movement. Um, back in the 1930s, a woman called um, Bella Dodd, she was a, a Catholic who became a Communist Party member and then went back to Catholicism. But while she was a, a, a communist, she helped to put 1,100 young communists into the Catholic priesthood. Now, you imagine what that would do over time. You know, 1960s, they had Vatican II, the big liberal push in the church. Well, those young communists would have been bishops and cardinals by then. They could help to push that through. So they've done this before. They did this in the um, Episcopalian Church. You know, the first communist front in America, first communist party front in America, in America was the Methodist Committee, Commission, Committee for Social Action. That was set up in America, the first Communist Party front. They went straight into the churches. 
because they knew that the churches were the bedrock of America. They could never take America from the outside. So they knew they had to take America from the inside and the churches were a great way of doing it because they could find these little points, you know, Christian charity, that's sort of like socialism, right? Welcoming neighbors, that's sort of like legal immigration, right? You know, um, loving thy neighbor, well, that's sort of socialist, isn't it? You know, Jesus was the original socialist, right? Well, if you don't know your Bible and you don't know Christianity, you can fall for that stuff. But if you do know your Bible and you do know Christianity, you're immune to that kind of thing. But unfortunately, the levels of biblical literacy in this country is so low and um, they, ain't, they ain't much better in a lot of the seminaries. They're not, lot, not that great in many of the pastors. Too many of them fall for this stuff. And once you've fallen for a scam, you don't like somebody who comes and points it out, do you? You don't like being embarrassed over it. So once you've fallen for this stuff, it's very hard to get you out of it because your pride comes up. You know, I've made a mistake, but I don't want to admit it. I don't want to look stupid in front of all my flock. You know, I'm supposed to be their leader. I'm the pastor. So like any scam, it becomes self-perpetuating. And, it, the, you know, and it just takes sometimes the little boy to call, call out the emperor's new clothes, the emperor's naked. You know, sometimes it takes that to make everybody say, well, yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, the church is getting Marxist. And and we're holding a conference in Iowa in October, a national conference on this issue. Um, just look it up online, Enemies Within the Church. And we welcome people to that. And then we hope to put the movie out either late this year or early next year. And if people want to look at it, just go to enemies within the enemies within the church dot com, and you can see a trailer there. You could donate to the cause, but it'll give you an idea of what we're planning to do and how we're planning to do it. Yeah, and, and I and I know with the conference, you know, coming up, you guys have a lot of great speakers involved. I know uh, we've got a few people that have been guests on on this podcast. Conversations with Jeff have had uh, Janet Mefford, John yeah, well, Harris, Sam key, Jones. She's a keynote speaker. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So, yeah. I, so I know the line, the lineup will be great. I know there'll be a lot of great information as well. Um, and then, what, what again was the was the website that people can go to sign up for that? It, it, enemieswithinthechurch dot com. Just enemieswithinthechurch dot com. You can see a trailer. You get some articles there of what we're planning to do and and why we are why we are doing this. And, and also, people can donate to it as well because this is all coming through public subscription essentially. We hope we've got some people who want to match what we, you know, bigger donors will match match what we get. But we've got to do it mainly through little, through smaller donors and the grassroots. And that's how we really want to do it. We want to make the grassroots the driving force of this movie. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, as we're kind of like wrapping up in that sort of thing, like if people want to follow you and know more about like what you're writing or what you're doing or, you know, that sort of thing, how can they follow you, whether it's social media, website, that sort of thing? Yeah, my, my basic website is trevorloudon.com. Trevorloudon.com, and Loudon is just L O U D O N. And I also have a website called KeyWiki, K E Y W I K I dot org, which has got lists of, uh, it's like a Wikipedia, but it's got 123,000 files of leftists. And you can look up a whole bunch of churchmen on that, um, pastors and you know, um, people from the Gospel Coalition and others and check out their leftist background. So the basic one is trevorloudon.com. Follow me on Facebook, just Trevor Loudon. Definitely. And, and again, thank you for sitting down with us and, you know, just having this conversation because I, th I think the more that we can get people to be talking about this issue both within Christianity and outside of Christianity the is the better because we're seeing – this infiltration, I think, happening in the Christian church, but also in the political systems and really around the world. And it's it's yeah. nuts how just cr how crazy wide and big this movement has become. Well, look, if you'd said 15 years ago, look, I started coming to this country 10 years ago and I was talking about the communist infiltration then and people would listen to me, but they sort of couldn't really see it. Well, they can see it now. You know, it's all over now. In the Democratic Party, it's in the labor unions, it's in the environmental movement, it's in Black Lives Matter, a, a, 
Women's March in Washington, D.C., led by communists. They've got a million people there, but it's also in the churches. And it's horrible for people to think, I've been going to this church for 35 years. I know everybody there. Why is my pastor, this new pastor, talking about social justice? Why have we got to go down and support refugee resettlement? Why are they telling us that abortion really isn't an issue anymore, that maybe we should consider Democrats? People, if that's happening in your church, that ain't that ain't the place to go to, to get you to heaven. That's a place leading you in the other direction now, unfortunately. So you got to fix that church or you got to go to another church. You got to, that's what you got to do. And um, your salvation's too important, you know, to listen to a podcast like this on a Tuesday than go to a communist church on a Sunday. Yep, one, I 100% agree. So, well, again, thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. We'll have to do it again sometime. And, you know, I, I know that uh, I'm excited to see how this uh, conference comes out and see it, seeing what's coming out of that and that sort of thing. And then I can't wait to see, can't wait to see the documentary, too, when it comes out. So. Look, the documentary is going to knock your socks off. It's going to be done in a spirit of love, but it ain't going to pull any punches. So, you know, I, I uh, we're all looking forward to having it come out. I think it's going to really shock a lot of people, thrill a lot of people. A lot of people are going to have to do some soul searching, but I think it's going to have an impact on millions of Americans and around the world too. So we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, definitely. Well, well thank you so much. And then for, for everybody else that's out there as well, uh, if you want more information on uh, this podcast or some of the other podcasts that we carry, go to gatekeepersonline.com. You can follow us on uh, Twitter at the GK Online. And um, yeah, tune in. I know uh, tomorrow we've got another guest. We've got Andy Woods coming on tomorrow that we'll be live streaming tomorrow, one o'clock Pacific time. So make sure you guys turn in for that. And um, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much.